Supreme Court of Texas. All persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of Texas, are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the Court is now sitting. God save the state of Texas and this Honorable Court. Please be seated. We'll hear argument in two cases this morning. First is 2737, United Rentals North America versus Evans from Dallas County and the 5th Court of Appeals District. Um, Justice Lehrman is not participating in that case. Um, and second is 21509, Finley Resources against Headington Royalty from Collin County and the 5th Court of Appeals District. Justice Lehrman is expecting to participate in the decision of that case. He cannot be present this morning. The court has allotted 20 minutes for each side in the two cases, uh, and we'll complete the arguments before lunch. Uh, the arguments are being webcast live uh, this morning and will be available in the court's archives later. We're ready to hear argument in 2737. Please report. Mr. Guthy will present argument for the petitioner. Petitioner has reserved five minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. This case was tried before the wrong jury, was submitted on the wrong theory, and yielded the wrong result. The first of those issues, the Batson issues in jury selection, and the last of those issues, the multi-million dollar survival damages award in a case involving instantaneous death, were so obvious that non-panel members of the Dallas Court of Appeals filed two separate dissents before the parties even had the opportunity to move for in-bank reconsideration. Uh, with the court's permission, I'd like to start the conversation today with the last of those issues, um, the damages questions and then um, discuss the two wrong turns that ultimately got us to that position. Um, at a minimum, this court must render judgment on the plaintiff's survival damages claim. Mr. Davis was killed as a result of two massive concrete beams falling on top of his vehicle. There's no evidence that Mr. Davis survived the impact um, of those concrete beams or that he even perceived those beams falling. The only thing the plaintiffs have ever offered um, in support of their survival damages claim is conjecture and speculation, which this court has made clear is not legally sufficient evidence. So, wasn't there some testimony from a medical, medical examiner that the skull remained intact and therefore he um, likely survived 15 seconds after the impact? The medical examiner did testify, and, and the Court of Appeals kind of interpreted that uh, testimony kind of in a slanted way, but when you view her testimony in context, it's quite clear that her uh, testimony is no evidence of conscious pain and suffering, um, and that is because prior to the medical examiner taking the stand, United Rentals objected and said, um, essentially, there's no valid basis for her to opine on conscious pain and suffering, and the plaintiffs agreed with that, and they said that we will not ask the medical examiner to opine on conscious pain and suffering. So the testimony that was elicited at trial was not from the plaintiffs. That was from a co-defendant who asked the medical examiner to confirm that she could not validly opine on the existence of pain and suffering. And so but what she the, said was... The two factual points that I just described, skull intact, may have survived 10 to 15 seconds after impact. Is that correct? I mean, that the record does contain those pieces of evidence. Uh, the, he did suffer the injuries to his skull, but the skull did, um, in large part, remain intact, and there was testimony that he would have had up to 15 seconds of oxygen in his body. That was the testimony of the medical examiner. But the ultimate conclusion from the medical examiner was that there was no way she could tell, um, to a medical, reasonable degree of medical certainty, whether he remained conscious, was completely unconscious, or was dazed. And so there was nothing that, you know, none, nothing within the medical records that she reviewed or um, the autopsy that would have allowed her to validly opine uh, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty that he was conscious after the beams fell. And so I think there's really three principles, any one of three principles the court could apply um, in rendering its judgment in this case on the survival damages claim. One, the court can rely upon its precedent, things like um, City of Keller that says speculation is not evidence. 
to it or rely on Otis Elevator and that line of cases that say, to the extent somebody's going to opine, offer a medical opinion, it needs to be to a reasonable degree of probability. The medical examiner in this case said she couldn't do that. And the third one is the equal inference rule. The medical examiner said that there's three possible scenarios, and I can't tell you which one of them is more likely than not. And so, you know, when you look at kind of to sort of shift um, the preponderance of the evidence standard a little bit, I mean, essentially the plaintiffs had to put up, put up 51% of the evidence that he was conscious, and the medical examiner said, I can't tell you, uh, you know, greater than 33% which one is more likely of those scenarios. So we disagree and think there's some evidence of pain and suffering. How do we go about reviewing the size of the award? And, and I, I do think that that is one of the, the major problems with the Court of Appeals opinion. As I alluded to, I don't think the court honestly gets there, but if the court does get to the question of damages, um, I, I do think that uh, the opinion in this case sort of underscores the unpredictability that's marred um, the review of non-economic damages in this case. Essentially, the Court of Appeals said, you know, said, here's some testimony. Juries have essentially unlimited discretion, so we're not going to review it. And I think um, the major flaw that I see in the Court of Appeals opinion is that they abdicate their duty as a common law court to look at precedent and make valid comparisons between pre-existing cases and the case before them. And they really did that in two respects. First, they did it with respect to uh, the proper method for conducting a legal sufficiency review. Um, I think if you really compare what this court has said a legal sufficiency review entails versus what the court of appeals did, they, they didn't do that. So I don't think you get to the damages, but if, certainly if you do, there's an abundant amount of case law that we've cited in uh, tab one of our bench book for the court, where other courts have considered the existence of a few seconds of pain and suffering. And they've essentially said um, that regardless of the severity, no matter how extreme the pain and suffering is, you cannot support a multi-million dollar reward off of a few seconds of pain and suffering. Um, and so I think, you know, the, the key takeaway for this court, if it gets to the to this excessiveness issue and the proper standard for reviewing that, <coughs> is uh, courts need to be cognizant of the fact that you need to treat like cases alike. That's one of the hallmarks of any system of justice. And the Court of Appeals essentially shooed that and said, uh, no two cases are comparable. But that's really well, the, the, jury, the jury has to start doing that. Um, and we're not here to second guess. You know, the, the jury is the, is the fact finder. We can review it for sufficiency. But I agree with you about the importance of treating like cases alike. But in order to aid the jury in doing that, shouldn't they be given some more information on what these kinds of damages are? other than just, you know, pain, and here physical pain and mental anguish were lumped together in a single blank, as I understand it. But there were no instructions requested, or it, were there any instructions requested on what those mean? Um, I, 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 the, the charge follows the pattern in, the pattern jury instructions, and so you're certainly correct that but there is not a lot of But you Parkway standard about nature, duration, and severity. No, no. We, not in this case. No. Why shouldn't we apply that standard, the nature, duration, and severity standard that we use in, in deciding whether there's legally sufficient evidence of the fact of damages, also to consider whether there's legally sufficient evidence of the amount of damages. I, I, I think that is, is a valid point, and I do think the court should do that. I think one of the key components, obviously, in assessing the amount of damages is the duration of the, the pain and suffering. And so, and it seems like, well, Parkway was about mental anguish, but it seems like nature, what's your position on whether nature, duration, and severity are also the right sort of factual comparators to look at as far as physical pain is concerned? Uh, I, I do. I agree with that. I do think that those are relevant considerations that need to be taken um, into context. Obviously, it's kind of a holistic standard um, that the court has to look to, but I do think those are valid um, Maybe the, even the dominant factors that the court should consider in, in reviewing, uh, or that courts should consider reviewing the amount of damages as well. The review would work both ways. If it was too little, if it was a thousand dollars in a very traumatic case. It, that is correct, Your Honor. And there are court of appeals opinions that have where plaintiffs have appealed their own, you know, verdicts in their favor, but uh, you know, awarding essentially nominal amounts for a dollar or a thousand dollars. Um, where the evidence didn't support that. So certainly 
the rule would cut both ways. On factual sufficiency, you could just say it's against the great weight of preponderance in order a new trial if it was too little. Correct. The, the Court of Appeals could. We, we couldn't on factual sufficiency. Correct. And that's, you know, I, as I alluded to, I don't think the court gets here, but to the extent the court addresses the standard for factual sufficiency, obviously that's a legal question this court has authority to address. What is a... How do you rationally connect evidence of pain and suffering to a number, to, to an amount of money? Like, I understand you can compare to prior cases. You can say this, this pain and suffering was worse than that pain and suffering. But in any given case, how do you connect the evidence of pain and suffering to a, an amount of money in a way that is rational and non-arbitrary? Uh, I mean, certainly that... You've hit the nail on the head. That's a difficult task where you're trying to convert a non-monetary injury into monetary compensation. And I think, you know, for a long time, that was the argument against allowing non-economic damages in these types of cases. But, you know, certainly the court has crossed over that threshold and has allowed them. Um, and so I think when you're looking at, you know, having already kind of crossed that river and now you're in the, the realm of trying to um, rationally award economic or money damages for a non-monetary injury. Um, I think, you know, in other cases, and certainly in this one, one relevant factor is the amount of, you know, for instance, medical expenses that were expended to alleviate the suffering. And so in this case, you know, it's not a perfect comparison because he died instantaneously, but I do think that that's at least some indicia of, you know, how quickly and how sudden and how short the duration of the injury was that the uh, Mr. Davis didn't even have the opportunity to seek medical attention. And so, obviously, if you have a large amount of medical expenditures, you're, for the most part, going to have longer durations of treatment and things like that. So I do think that is one critical component that courts can look to. And obviously, in this case, there's zero uh, you know, dollars that were spent to alleviate the pain and suffering. So I think that's at least you know some evidence that the court can look to in trying to rationalize what is a reasonable amount to award uh, for non if we agree with you on the Batson issue, I assume we wouldn't reach any of the these damages questions. Uh, no, I think they would. Uh, well, so the relief that United Rentals requesting is a rendition of judgment, and I can address that next year. Uh, I think there is a wrong submission, and I, we owe no duty under the facts of these cases. So I think the first threshold the court has to answer is: Is there a complete rendition in United Rentals' favor? The second question is: Even if a new trial is granted, either under Batson or the evidentiary and charge issues we raise. Um, I, I, United Rentals is still requesting rendition on the survival damages claim. There's no evidence to support that claim, and that claim should not be allowed to proceed uh, on a subsequent retrial. <coughs> and so, to kind of, uh, with the last few minutes, I would like to address uh, the wrong theory. Before you get to that, uh, I had one other question on the amount of damages. So the, the plaintiffs argue that consciousness of impending death can support an award for pre-death mental anguish. Um, do you disagree with that? And if not, is it a problem that this jury instruction submits both physical pain and mental anguish so that evidence of either can be sufficient to uphold the number or the, the amount of damages that the jury awarded? Uh, so... My, my personal opinion, and what we've articulated in the brief, is that intermediate courts of appeals have recognized that pre-impact um, anguish, you know, anticipating death, is a recoverable element. But this court in Bowles quite clearly said that negligent infliction of emotional distress is not a recoverable element of damages. And I think that analysis applies because essentially um, the pre-impact mental anguish is an equivalent to a negligent infliction of emotional distress. There's been no well, impact except that there point. is actually a physical injury that accompanies it here. Well, subsequent, subsequent to Pretty it. Pretty shortly subsequent. Correct. Um, but I don't think that that ultimately uh, is, should be a deciding factor for the court because independent of whether it's a recoverable element of damages or not, there's no evidence in this case that he actually did perceive the beams falling. The evidence was that it took less than a second for the beams to fall. Um, and the most that anybody could say was that Mr. Davis maybe perceived them. He, it's undisputed that he did not react to them. There's no indications from anybody else on the freeway, for instance, that he had attempted to break or take any type of evasive action before the accident. And so I think even, again, under a legal sufficiency um, point, there's no evidence of pre-impact anguish or post-impact 
and suffering. Um, so for, for the last you know, minute and 30 seconds, I would like to briefly address the no duty issue that we raised. This case can concerns the well-defined duties of motor carriers and their drivers in an attempt to shift those duties onto shippers. Motor carriers such as large trucking and their drivers own non-delegable duties under state and federal regulations uh, with respect to the safe loading, securing, and transportation of cargo. But just because those are non-delegable doesn't mean that other parties can't also owe the same duties, right? Um, yeah, certainly they can be assumed, and so that's one of the issues in this case is could, for instance... I mean, I, I'm not talking about negligent undertaking, though. I, a non-delegable duty is not necessarily an exclusive duty, is it? Um, it, is, it is not, but it, within this context, I do think that the duties are owned exclusively by the motor carrier. So I mean, what about I, Administrative Code 21981 that says a person loading a vehicle shall comply with this chapter, where the chapter says no loads higher than um, well, there's there's two issues with that. Is one, it references back to Chapter 621 of the Texas Transportation Code, and the height requirement only applies to the drivers and its motor carriers. It doesn't apply to loaders. But the administrative code applies it to loaders. Well, it says applies Chapter 621 as applicable, and so the the, the actual provisions of the Transportation Code are uh, applicable. And the other thing that I would also point out is that in this context, United Rentals wasn't actually um, the loader of this. A loader is a clearly defined term um, under the transportation regulations. And in this context, um, the loader was actually Mr. Martinez, the driver for the motor carrier, who was essentially you know, spotting the positioning of the equipment on this truck. So United's employee who drove the boom lift onto the trailer is not also a loader? Not within the technical meaning. Uh, and, and certainly the only reason that United Rentals undertook that activity uh, was because Mr. Martinez was not familiar with the uh, operations of this specific piece of equipment. But in any other context, Mr. Martinez would have actually loaded the equipment on there. It was just because he was unfamiliar with the uh, mechanics on this particular piece of equipment. Any other questions? Thank you, Council. Thank you. We'll hear from the respondents. Okay, please support. Mr. Alexander will present an argument for the respondent. <clears throat> May it please the court. Um, I'd like to address three issues, having heard all the questions. Let me talk briefly about the pre-impact question you raised, pre-impact damages. Uh, then I'll talk about the size of the award. You just asked about that, you mentioned Justice Blacklock. And then finally, conscious pain and suffering. I can do them in different orders, but I, I think that would be a good way to do it. So on the pre-impact, it turns out, interestingly enough, that nationwide there is a conflict in authorities as to whether you can uh, recover damages for the immediate appreciation of death. Um, and so, for instance, Kansas uh, would not allow rec recovery. Um, as they pointed out, intermediate courts of appeals in Texas for years have recognized that. That appears to be in the majority view that you can recover for it. And there's a decision by this court that I'll cite, YOWL, Y-O-W-E-L-L -L versus Piper Aircraft, 703 Southwest 2nd, 630. And that was a decision by the, the Texas Supreme Court, this court in 1986. Um, and, it, and it addressed the question of whether the a, a plane broke up in flight and the people plummeted to the ground, whether they could recover for that interval of time, the anguish they felt. And the answer was yes. And, and the, the phrase that this court used was, as long as it's part of the same transaction or occurrence. <laughs> and here, as you pointed out, Justice Busby, the, um, the collision, the impact followed a moment. So I think Gal answers that question. But we don't know necessarily uh, from the evidence whether uh, there was consciousness. Right? This is the point that Justice Boyd raised. And let me turn to that. So let me turn to that next. Um, the answer is we do know. And, and I think that let me, let me tell you the authorities that you should look at with respect to that. The first one is Dodge Hill, decision by this court in 1979, 582 Southwest 2nd, 102. 
Um, and that is where the court said, and, and let me just back up and explain. So the testimony here with respect to conscious pain and suffering came from the medical exam. This was not a retained expert. This was someone who actually performed the autopsy. So is there, a, is there a difference between the consciousness analysis for consciousness of death and, and consciousness to feel pain? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. In other words, there, there's pre-impact mental anguish. Right. You know, I am fearing impending death. Right. Then there is conscious pain and suffering. So what's the evidence on the first of those two things that, that says more likely than not? He was conscious of impending death. Okay. Before, I mean, the other is pain. Yeah, yeah, you get yeah, to yeah. The pain. No, the, yeah, the evidence of that came from the expert witness who said that there was a interval of nine tenths of a second before you know the actual collision. Uh, and if he was rendered unconscious, which I will point out to you, he was not. But that was the evidence on that. It, it comes strictly from but the, I thought expert. the expert. The experts said maybe. I mean, it, it, does it have to be to a reasonable? Certainty and some like I that. well, I think I, I think I think there has to be a reasonable hurdle. Yes, I do, and and I think in this case, I mean, clearly, if that were all we had, if we did not have conscious pain and suffering, then I don't think we could justify this award. To be clear, not just reasonableness, but likelihood. Reasonable likelihood, correct? Okay. Yes. Yes. It's reasonable to think that he might have. That he might have, but that in reasonable likelihood he did. Yes. 51%. That's correct. And now, so let me turn to the. Do you want me to go to conscious pain and suffering or talk about the size of the award? Sure. Okay. So let's uh, back to that. So the Stodgill case by this court, again, we have a, a the medical examiner who was not hired to do this. Um, she did not use the magic words. A reasonable medical probability, but this court said in Stodgill, that is not what you focus on. The other case is the one they cited, Otis Elevator versus Wood, decision by Justice Greenhill. And, and he says what you need to focus on is the substance of the testimony um, in context. And then, of course, the overlay of all that is, because this is a legal sufficiency challenge, we look at City of Keller. And so we have to look at the testimony in the light most favorable to the verdict. And, and I want to, I just want to read her testimony and, and ask the court to view it through that lens or those lenses. Uh, this is what she says. He may or may not have been knocked unconscious and there's no way to know for sure. Insert. Since he has no other real internal head injuries, I don't have anything anatomic, because I do anatomy, to pull me in that direction, that is, in the direction of unconsciousness. On the other hand, certainly there have been people who, in terms of anatomy, only had a subscapular hemorrhage, that's what we're talking about, a contusion, and were knocked unconscious, so that's a maybe. The only fair way that you can read that testimony viewed through the lens is looking at the anatomy, the hard evidence. I don't have anything, you know, back to your point, his entire body was crushed, but his skull was not. And the, and the injury to the head was not serious. And so her testimony is, nothing's pulling me in the direction of his being unconscious, but anatomically. Didn't your client have the burden to prove the consciousness necessary? To experience that pain and suffering. To the level of reasonable probability. Right. And, but, but here, all she's saying is well, there's some evidence of a lack of uh, uh, damage to the skull that yes. would render him unconscious. But I don't have anything to pull me from that to consciousness. Never gets to anywhere. No, it's the other way around. To yeah. It's okay. Yeah. It, this is the point. Anatomically, the, the concrete evidence, of, once again, we're not talking here, this is not, you know, cart tracks through spilled macaroni, where we don't know how long it's been on the ground. This is someone who has done 8,000 autopsies, um, 2,000 in, in traffic fatalities, who's testifying that anatomically, 
there is nothing that is pulling her in the direction of unconsciousness. She acknowledges that it's a possibility that he was was rendered unconscious because, and he says, that's a baby, because certain people with a minor injury that happens to. But, but reading this fairly through the lens of Stachiel, Otis Elevator, and in City of Keller, it compels the conclusion that she's saying, even though she's not a paid expert, with reasonable medical probability, he was conscious for 10 to 15 seconds. Which brings us now to the questions about the size of the body. But I, I think Mr. Kathy said that that, that specific testimony, that evidence, read in context has to include that the witness then went on to say, so there are three possibilities here and there's no way I can make conclusions. Well, I think that what she's saying, again, used through the lens is, I cannot tell you with certainty which of these is true. And certainty is not the test. So she, she's acknowledging, as a, as a physician who's not a professional expert, that she's acknowledging, I cannot tell you with certainty which of these was. But if you read her testimony fairly through those lenses, she's acknowledging conscious pain and suffering. So that brings us then to the size of the board. And, and the question was raised about heart weight, whether that could be used. I think there's a couple of things that could be used. Let's start with Parkway. Um, I do think that Parkway is readily adaptable to conscious pain and suffering. Duration, I'm sorry, nature, duration, severity. And, and this case actually provides a solid example of how that can be done. What was the nature of the injury? This man's entire body was crushed except for his skull. Six of the eight major arteries to her heart, his heart were ripped off. So the nature of his injuries are unlike any that hopefully any of us will see again. Nature. Duration, 10 to 15 seconds. Solid evidence of that. That's how much oxygen he had left in him. Right? Severity, off the charts. Off the charts. The jury was entitled to conclude that if he was conscious, as they reasonably concluded for 10 to 15 seconds, that was unimaginable pain. And $5 million. Was there, was there evidence about that? Because, you know, there is this, uh, with, with trauma, there's shock. And, and so, was there evidence about, about the severity? Well, <laughs> nobody was with him in the field. So the only evidence we have, to be clear, is the testimony of the medical examiner. That's the evidence we have. And I think that that evidence, again, viewed through the lenses I've described, permits a reasonable juror, which brings me to my second point. Beyond the Parkway standard, you have two decisions, one from 2014, the other 2018, by this court. Um, Waste Management versus Texas Disposal, and Anderson versus Durant, where this court says that non-pecuniary damages are measured by an amount that a reasonable person could possibly estimate as fair compensation. So that's, that's another standard um, that this court has not expressly adopted for purposes of pain and suffering, but I think fits. And it, and it dovetails nicely with your jurisprudence on factual sufficiency review. So that's that's another one in addition to Parkway that can be used. The jury told, here's the number that we think you should award, and, and here's why. Was the jury given a reason on how you can link this number to this, to this pain and I, I don't recall specifically. I think that the answer is yes. I think that the number was larger than five million. I could be wrong. But part of the problem is, and, and we just have to recognize this, this court, I mean, they, they talk about how, you know, in 1886, this court rejected shocks to conscience. That's actually not true. If you look at that decision, it's Gulf versus CSNF, CNSF Railroad. It's cited in, in their brief. What you'll see is the court wrestles with shocks to conscience, 
and wrestles with the fact that, as you point out, how how do we how do we deal with damages? And the answer they come up with is we can't do any better than what we're doing. That is, you give it to the jury, but recognize that there are cases that are outliers. And that's where the courts intervened and corrected. In that case, they didn't. In that case, after going through the wrestling of, and this is Texas Supreme Court, wrestling with the question of what the number should be, they ultimately allowed it to, to stand. Um, and there's no intimation here that uh, the evidence was, or the suggestion was made to award bell language damages for some improper purpose, like because you should punish well, no, the thank you. or any, there was nothing that inflamed the jury. There was nothing that inflamed the jury, and, and, and thank you for raising that, because if you look at the jury's answers on liability, I think that that will demonstrate to you that we're dealing with, we're not dealing with runaway jury. They made nuanced decisions regarding the allocation of responsibility, 50% on the truck driver, 10% on the uh, contractor who built the bridge, 10% on the uh, engineering company that managed the project, and 30% on United Rentals. Furthermore, they were asked to award, uh, they were asked for an award of punitive damages, but they did not have a unanimous verdict. And because of that, no punitive damages were awarded. So when you look at the verdict in the case, what you see is a jury that grappled with these decisions, made very nuanced uh, decisions, and back to your point, nothing about punishment. Quite the contrary, they elected, they well, there was no punishment that was awarded because punitive damages are awarded. I want to give you some time on the bats issue, and particularly the question of whether, you know, when a lawyer gets up and says, uh, black females are the best jurors for me, and then uses all of his strikes, or all the strikes that he uses, he uses on people who are in the hut of that description. Uh, how, how, do we, uh, how do we allow that to, to stand? I mean, I, it, it, I wonder whether just that statement, as innocent as it might have felt in the context of that situation, whether that can, uh, that doesn't just pollute proceeding and, and result in the kind of a, a, a record that, that we just should not allow to support a judgment. Well, I think I think context matters. I mean, I think you, you hit the nail on the head with that. In the case you need to look at, and it's cited on my, my exhibit, Powers versus Palacios, that's the decision that they rely upon, saying that the making of that statement is per se a bad violation. But let's look at the context in which that was made. This is what the court said. Upon inquiry from the trial court, counsel for Palacios did concede that race was a factor in his determination to exercise the peremptory challenge. The focus is on the exercise of the strike. Okay. And that was the context that we we're dealing with in Palacios. Well, in your context here is that counsel is raising a that's a challenge to yes. the other side. Yes. And, and saying, for whatever reason, we know this, but doesn't that demonstrate that just that both sides were using gender and race as a proxy in their jury selection? And when you have that kind of direct evidence uh, combined with statistical evidence, particularly here of, of, gen of strikes based on gender, then... <laughs> You know, then can a, a district court credit the race-neutral reasons that are then given to justify those strikes? So it's not a typical Baxton case where there's statistical disparity, no evidence of improper motive anywhere in the record, and then you ask for race-neutral reasons, and the, and the trial court's supposed to evaluate the credibility of those reasons. But in this case, we've got uh, statements made about uh, uh, using improper or discriminatory reasons as proxies for potential biases in the case. Well, what, what, we we have, that? what we have here is that clearly, and you look at the pattern of their strikes, and you look at the statement made, 
both sides are aware. I mean, both sides have jury consultants. Let's, let's clear that up. They had two. We had one. Well, no way you can jury consultants telling people to, to lawyers to pick jurors based on race and gender. Should that would be that, that that that's a Batson violation. That is a Batson violation. If the if the strikes are made based upon race, that's a Batson violation. And that's why, in this case, the trial judge did what this court has told it to do, and that went, went through for 78 pages. And that's not counting the time she spent studying it, looking at each side's explanations for their strikes. And, and, and a good lawyer is probably going to be able to come up with another explanation. So what do we do with that? Well, what you do with that is, is what, you, what, what the court said in Batson and this court said in Davis we trust the trial court to make those credibility determinations. Even when there's an express admission that one of the one of the things that they're looking at is what their jury consultant told them to look at, which is race and gender. Well, let's look at that. So in the Batson case, we had an African-American defendant being represented by an attorney who says they are striking because of race. That lawyer is saying they are striking people favorable to my client. This case in Davis, the plaintiff is an African American. The strikes being made are they are trying to strike people who are favorable to my client. So if you ask those lawyers in those cases, are you saying that the black juror is going to be more favorable to your client? What's the answer going to be? Yes. So unless you just want to do away with Batson and say that we, we anytime somebody who is transparently saying I'm trying to protect my client, then you can't get there. So it, it, when you look at, and we don't have time in 46 seconds, but when you look through each of the, the examinations of the strike made by this trial judge, where his explanation was being provided as to this is why I was doing it, it's very clear that there was no abuse of discretion. What if, and what that's the other side. What if the other side had cut up and said, uh, we know that white men are the best jurors. Said what? We know that white men are the best jurors, and that's that's why, Your Honor, that's why you know, our, that explains our behavior and their behavior. Uh, I mean, I, I feel like we wouldn't we wouldn't be here arguing about this. I think every, everybody would that, that that would shock the conscience, right? To, to use the term from the damages discussion, and I, I wonder why this doesn't equally shock the conscience. Well, I think once again, you have to do it in terms of the context in which it was made. This is not Powers versus Palacios. He is not talking. We're not at the strike stage. He is saying exactly what a, a lawyer would be saying, representing a client in Batson and Davis. I am trying to protect something from strikes. And let me just take a few moments to just talk about. Uh, well, I take your point that you can, could make that, um, that argument in connection with the other side strikes, yes. but does that immunize, immunize you from an examination of the strikes you've made? No, and, and in this case, there were five challenges, and the trial judge went through each one, one by one, and, and you know, listened to the evidence, did exactly what this court said to do, which is to judge the credibility for those explanations and concluded that there was, that these were not race motivated. And look at, and look here, let me just spend one moment, because I know the next argument has been put off. So let me, uh, I'm, I, I'm over the red light. Uh, up to you, Chief. One minute. So, you know, when, when you look at the strikes that were made by the, uh, the plaintiffs in this case, Justice Evans says plaintiffs used 100% of their strikes on non-black men. So that is pregnant with notions that, that the, the, the plaintiffs were making nuanced decisions about gender and race. But when you look at the chart, yeah, and the idea being that they were leaving black men alone, how many black men are there here? There's none. So, and, and, and the fact that they used only five of the six strikes is important. I mean, the intimation, the, 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 you know, the inference was, the inference on this record is had they had more strikes, they would have struck more males. They had more strikes. 
they didn't strike one land. So, I, I, again, back to the main question. The fact that this lawyer was transparent in explaining why it was that they were exercising their strikes in the way they were doing, which is what you require to do at stage three of Batson. That's the burden. He's saying this to carry the burden. That cannot be flipped around and go, aha, you've committed the Batson violation to get them to trial. We can't get rid of Batson, but if we got rid of peremptory strikes, we wouldn't have this problem either. True. So, but that's not it. As opposed to having decisions from this court instructing people on how to kill someone. Yeah, but that would be, yeah, I mean, that would be a discussion for another day, whether, you, you know, we should get rid of peremptory strikes. But, I mean, the answer to your question straight up is true. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Hatchmeyer. I'd like to begin uh, my rebuttal by addressing the damages issue, which consumed the majority uh, of the questioning for the respondent. And the first is to address uh, the question with regard to whether the testimony of the medical examiner was speculative. We cited uh, that testimony in our brief, but for the court's re reference, it's 16, uh, volume 16, reporter's record, page 42. And the medical examiner is asked explicitly. Uh, whether one or other of the case, whether as between the three options, um, it's pure speculation, even to you as a medical doctor and a medical scientist. And the answer is, there's nothing to distinguish those. I mean, she, the medical examiner admitted it would be pure speculation for her to testify that he was conscious. And that is the gist of the testimony uh, that is in the record. And that's the ultimate conclusion that was left by the medical examiner. Um, and with respect to how the jury arrived at its award, um, it was an improper argument to, to uh, answer Justice Bland's question. The jury was told by plaintiff's counsel um, to award $10 million and divide it up however you see fit. There was no attempt to link the $5 million award in this case to um, the, pain, the duration um, of any conscious pain and suffering, I mean, presumably because there was none. And so this is kind of a situation where you have um, in Bentley, where this court admonished, uh, made clear that juries cannot just, you know, fill in the blank with anything based off of attorney argument, which is not evidence. And that's precisely what occurred in this case. The jury came back with a $9.7 million total award. We're here challenging the $5 million survival damages award. But the jury did exactly... if, if uh, a counsel had not suggested a local number, but just said to the jury, uh, use your best judgment in determining the amount. Would there be anything wrong with that? Um, I, I don't know that that would be um, improper per se in terms of, you know, reversible error, but certainly I think that would be, um, you know, fodder for a sufficiency challenge um, and would be relevant to a court's analysis. And I think when you look at tab one of our bench book, I went back and readjusted all of the numbers for inflation through today. Um, and the average award for seconds of conscious pain and suffering um, is $66,000 unadjusted for inflation and $120,000. So we're 40, the award in this case is 41 times larger than the adjusted, inflation adjusted average in cases. And there's just no explanation for that kind of outlier. If um, we were to look at other cases, do you have a position on how we should do that? The Fifth Circuit uses the maximum recovery rule, other courts have done it differently. What's your position? Um, if, if we do that, what's the My position would be that the court needs to look at affirmed awards uh, where there was a sufficiency challenge. And the reason I say that is because I don't think you can just take jury verdicts. In a perfect world, liability facts would not influence damages, but it's quite clear that we don't live in a perfect world and that, you know, inflammatory liability facts do affect jury's damages numbers. And so I think if you look at just sheer verdicts um, or, you know, results where a court of appeals affirmed but it was subsequently overturned for, you know, on liability or something else, I don't think those are valid comparisons because clearly you had this uh, influence on the jury's verdicts in those cases. And so I do think to the extent the court's going to look at anything, it should be affirmed verdicts um, in other cases where there was a sufficiency challenge. And with the last minute, I would like to briefly touch uh, 
upon something that wasn't addressed and that I do think the court should not overlook, and that is our request for rendition. Um, in this case, United Rentals, uh, not only, it, it fulfilled its duties as the shipper in this case. It not only provided the equipment that was requested by Mr. Martinez, but it provided a bill of lading that laid out all of the specifications for that equipment, including its height and its size. And so that bill of lading confirmed what was obvious to everybody was that Mr. Martinez was tasked with delivering a boom lift um, to Irving. And the fact that Mr. Martinez signed the bill of lading, I think, is consequential. That confirms that he had the right piece of equipment. The plaintiffs in this case are continually asserting that he didn't have the right piece of equipment based off of some pre existing bid documentation. But the case law we have cited has been quite clear that the bill of lading superseded all of those prior documents. Let's say, John, I can disagree with you on this duty question. I understood you to say earlier that you have a, a separate, that you consider your no evidence challenge on the non economic damages to be a separate rendition point. I do. As to that. Correct, claim. Your Honor. I, I do think. Even if we get a new trial, Your Honor, I think that that claim should be excluded from, from the trial and rendition would be appropriate on that. Any other questions? Thank you, Counselor. The case is submitted. Thank you, Your Honor. The court will take a brief recess.